Welcome to Vitsu Publishing. This audiobook is protected by copyright. While the original work is in the public domain, unauthorized copying or distribution of this recording could lead to legal action. For a physical or digital copy of the book, please visit our website. Enjoy your listening. A Short History of England by G.K. Chesterton Chapter 1 Introduction it will be very reasonably asked why I should consent, though upon a sort of challenge, to write even a popular essay in English history, who make no pretense to particular scholarship and are merely a member of the public. The answer is that I know just enough to know one thing, that a history from the standpoint of a member of the public has not been written. What we call the popular histories should rather be called the anti-popular histories. They are all, nearly without exception, written against the people and in them the populace is either ignored or elaborately proved to have been wrong. It is true that Green called his book a short history of the English people, but he seems to have thought it too short for the people to be properly mentioned. For instance, he calls one very large part of his story Puritan England. But England never was Puritan. It would have been almost as unfair to call the rise of Henry of Navarre Puritan France and some of our extreme Whig historians would have been pretty nearly capable of calling the campaign of Wexford and Drogheda Puritan Ireland. But it is especially in the matter of the Middle Ages that the popular histories trample upon the popular traditions. In this respect, there is an almost comic contrast between the general information provided about England in the last two or three centuries, in which its present industrial system was being built up, and the general information given about the preceding centuries, which we call broadly medieval, of the sort of waxwork history which is thought sufficient for the sideshow of the age of abbots and crusaders, a small instance will be sufficient. A popular encyclopedia appeared some years ago, professing among other things to teach English history to the masses, and in this I came upon a series of pictures of the English kings, no one could expect them to be all authentic, but the interest attached to those that were necessarily imaginary. There is much vivid material in contemporary literature for portraits of men like Henry II or Edward I, but this did not seem to have been found or even sought. And wandering to the image that stood for Stephen of Blois, my eye was staggered by a gentleman with one of those helmets with steel brims curved like a crescent, which went with the age of ruffs and trunk hose. I am tempted to suspect that the head was that of a halberdier at some such scene as the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, but he had a helmet, and helmets were medieval, and any old helmet was good enough for Stephen. Now suppose the readers of that work of reference had looked for the portrait of Charles I and found the head of a policeman. Suppose it had been taken, modern helmet and all, out of some snapshot in the daily sketch of the arrest of Mrs. Pankhurst. I think we may go so far as to say that the readers would have refused to accept it as a lifelike portrait of Charles I. They would have formed the opinion that there must be some mistake. Yet the time that elapsed between Stephen and Mary was much longer than the time that has elapsed between Charles and ourselves. The revolution in human society between the first of the Crusades and the last of the Tudors was immeasurably more colossal and complete than any change between Charles and ourselves. And above all, that revolution should be the first thing and the final thing in anything calling itself a popular history. For it is the story of how our populace gained great things, but today has lost everything. Now I will modestly maintain that I know more about English history than this, and that I have as much right to make a popular summary of it as the gentleman who made the crusader and the halberdier change hats. But the curious and arresting thing about the neglect one might say the omission of medieval civilization in such histories as this, lies in the fact I have already noted. It is exactly the popular story that is left out of the popular history. For instance, even a working man, a carpenter or cooper or bricklayer, has been taught about the Great Charter as something like the Great Auk, save that its almost monstrous solitude came from being before its time instead of after. He was not taught that the whole stuff of the Middle Ages was stiff with the parchment of charters, that society was once a system of charters and of a kind much more interesting to him. The carpenter heard of one charter given to barons and chiefly in the interest of barons. The carpenter did not hear of any of the charters given to carpenters, to coopers, to all the people like himself. Or, to take another instance, 
The boy and girl reading the stock simplified histories of the schools practically never heard of such a thing as a burger until he appears in a shirt with a noose round his neck. They certainly do not imagine anything of what he meant in the Middle Ages, and Victorian shopkeepers did not conceive themselves as taking part in any such romance as the adventure of Courtrai, where the medieval shopkeepers more than won their spurs, for they won the spurs of their enemies. I have a very simple motive and excuse for telling the little I know of this true tale. I have met in my wanderings a man brought up in the lower quarters of a great house, fed mainly on its leavings and burdened mostly with its labours. I know that his complaints are stilled and his status justified by a story that is told to him. It is about how his grandfather was a chimpanzee and his father a wild man of the woods, caught by hunters and tamed into something like intelligence. In the light of this, he may well be thankful for the almost human life that he enjoys, and may be content with the hope of leaving behind him a yet more evolved animal. Strangely enough, the calling of this story by the sacred name of progress ceased to satisfy me when I began to suspect, and to discover, that it is not true. I know by now enough at least of his origin to know that he was not evolved, but simply disinherited. His family tree is not a monkey tree, save in the sense that no monkey could have climbed it. Rather, it is like that tree torn up by the roots and named Dedishado on the shield of the unknown knight.